So you saved this wonderful, majestic building and its historic significance, the uh, inheritance of Benjamin Franklin, uh, who didn't exactly think that uh, after a couple centuries and a half that the post office would mutate into Staples <laughs> no. or other big box stores where they want to have kiosks and get rid of uh, the local post office. There are 32,000 branches and central offices, more than Walmart and, and uh, McDonald's and a couple other big chains combined. So you've got 32,000 outlets, community outlets, nonprofit outlets, gathering places, places where our federal information about your needs and your rights can be posted, where people can talk things up uh, and meet, as well as get postal services. So this is not just a matter of stamps or delivery on Saturday, important as that is. This is a fundamental institution that binds the country together. It can be it can be updated. It can be updated. It can be freed from the shackles of uh, UPS and FedEx and others who have made sure that the post office is prevented from delivering beer and wine, for example, other things it can't do to get revenue increases. Now, watch what happens when the myth, the propaganda of the collapsing post office is exposed. The U.S. Postal Service is a public corporation. It's the only major corporation in the United States that is a creditor of Uncle Sam, a creditor of the U.S. Treasury. Since it was established in 1970, it hasn't received a penny in subsidy from the taxpayer. Very few people know that. Very few people know that. In, 19, in 2006, a Trojan horse bill was passed through Congress that requires the Postal Service to overpay, vastly overpay for its pension benefits, for which it has a $60 billion outstanding credit to it from Uncle Sam, or the U.S. Treasury. That's where being a creditor. Of course, the U.S. Treasury has already spent the money on, you know, wars like support, supporting Israeli imperialism or the military or the military industrial complex and the F-35 and the Trident submarines which can blow up 200 cities per submarine around the world in 45 minutes. They don't have any money for the U.S. Postal Service. But they don't need that money. They just need to repay the overpay on retiree benefits and the huge overpay for health insurance. There's no corporation in the country that is required by law to prepay 75 years in advance of health benefits. 75 years. So if you eliminate these prepays and get down to normal, prudent accounting, the post office about breaks even. Can you imagine, even with the reception, even with the internet, even with all the young people abandoning the post office, imagine if they would ever send a thank you letter by postage. <laughs> they don't even know what postage is, okay? Even with all of that, according to the data, and Senator Bernie Sanders has put this out, go to his website, you'll see. It's about breaking even in the last five, six years. Just about breaking even. So this is an exaggerated crisis built in with Trojan horses in order to fulfill a number of purposes. One is to deliver more business to the parasite uh, pr private corporations. Okay, that's one. The second is to deliver real estate to the developers and their brokers. This, this is... This is, not, this is not just a historic post office. It's just a piece of valuable real estate all over, all over the country. They want to convert. If they don't knock them down, they'll convert them into other commercial operations. All right, so I write in, in October, yes, October of last year, I wrote Senator Dianne Feinstein 
a letter. She is the she's a spouse of Richard Blum. Okay, yeah, I take it you know Richard Blum. Now look look at the sweetheart look at the sweetheart deal he cut his his firm is called CBRE C B Richard Ellis Group. He's the chair. All right, so he gets a contract. This is where people were asleep, and the unions were asleep. He, ha he signed a contract to sell off postal properties all over the country without competitive bidding. He can actually deliver some of these to his business associates. Talk about conflict of interest. And he now has amended the contract so he can do his own appraisal. How about this? You appraise the property so that you can sell it for less than real market value, even though the contract says they have to sell it for real market value. He said, well, we appraised it. It just, you know, things are tough. It didn't come in. And then he sells it to his buddies. Now, the Inspector General of the U.S. Postal Service issued a withering report condemning us. So you can go to the Postal Service website and you can get it. And also, Peter Byrne, he's not here now, but he's with the uh, East Bay, is it? Uh, what paper is he with? Let's see. He published in East Bay. Yeah, he published in the East Bay Express, and he exposed all this. <laughs> so you see, you have more than a nostalgic reason to preserve this. You have more than a historic reason to preserve this. You have more than a functional reason to preserve this. I mean, companies go up and down, right? Sometimes they go bankrupt and they're rescued by the taxpayer and they come back like General Motors and, and Chrysler, right? But of course that's never permitted for an awesome historic institution like the U.S. Postal Service, right? It's they don't get bailed out. They don't get bailed the out. the biggest union in the country. They don't get bailed out. And what you need to do is also to oppose this for corporate crime purposes. Because what's going on here is a sweetheart deal. It's a lot of shady stuff. So you want to preserve this postals, post office, you expose Richard Blum. Now Richard Blum, uh, he throws his weight around. He's reshaping the University of California in commercial images and corporatized images. Uh, but he's also on the Board of Regents. He's no longer the chair, but he's on the Board of Regents. So next time the Board of Regents meet, what you ought to do is go there, make this the issue. Pick the plum out. Friend, friend the, and the board of Muda. And you're not lacking for any slogans. Okay? So here's the strategies I suggested, you've got your own, is you've got to show it's a building momentum. That's what they're afraid of. Something is building, because they, they know how to wait people out. Oh, they showed up, just ignore them, and they'll get tired, and they'll wait out. Now, in the process, you're educating your children and your grandchildren into why this postal service nationwide is so important. When the chips are down and something is definitely needed for delivery and it cannot be de delivered over the Internet and private corporations say it's not profitable enough, what's left in 32,000 areas around the country? It's the U.S. Postal Service. Okay? I, mean, I remember when I was a kid, it was only a few years, years earlier, they delivered eggs. Literally. They, overnight, they delivered eggs. Sometime in the afternoon. Farmer Jones in the morning, they got it in the afternoon. Okay, so now there's another drive here that's important. That is, in getting more revenue for the Postal Service and breaking the shackles that prevent it from doing this, 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 even internet things, they're restricted. The, the board of directors of the U.S. Postal Service has been dominated since 1970 by corporatists. So you have the Postmaster General, he takes his orders from a corporate board of directors. And so you have the President's Democrat Republican routinely appointing a majority of people who come from corporations or corporate consulting firms. There are 32 million people in this country who are unbanked. Not only 32 million workers who make less today than 1968 adjusted for inflation. Imagine, 46 years ago. I mean, how much can people take in this country? Answer, a lot. How much can they take? 
Answer, a lot. How much should they take? None. None. Nothing. Okay, so you have 32 million unbanked people. Why? Because it costs money to have a banking account. You know, Bank of America charges Citigroup, PNC. They all charge you, and they want to charge you uh, like a credit card company if you don't have enough in the bank at the end of the month. So you have 32 million. Well, up until 1968, there was the U.S. Postal Savings, part of the post office. They had a bank. You went, you put your savings in, you got a little interest, you could borrow money. That was terminated by the banking lobby, 1968. Now, now we are seeing a growing movement to a growing movement to bring it back. You say, you don't want 32 million customers? Okay, too bad. We're not going to let them be unbanked. We're not going to let them not unable to remit money back to their native countries, feed their families without getting 10% gouged and so forth. So there is a growing effort now. Uh, in fact, the Inspector General of, uh, uh, of the Postal Regulatory Commission is, has come out um, saying this is a pretty good idea. It could happen. The need is enormous, you know, over 30 million people. And it has historical uh, antecedents. So, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Yay! Before you say yay, her latest vote was to support $230 million to pay for Israel's marauding of the Gaza people. And we have to pay now for it. Okay. Okay. So, anyway, not to change the subject. But. There is a problem with Elizabeth Warren uh, on foreign and military policy, generally. She's terrific domestic, really t terrific. There. And she is a big champion on the postal savings, and she knows what she's talking about. So connect with her. She's looking for, you know, people. She has a staff that answers inquiries and tells you what's been written and what's going on. Uh, but when you have the Inspector General Self inside the postal complex saying this is a pretty good idea, that's a pretty good start. Also, Bernie Sanders is for it, Sherrod Brown is for it, and they're, they're probably 10, 15. I would even think that Senator Boxer would be uh, for it. Now, when I wrote Senator Feinstein, uh, she said, Look, I, I'm just married to the guy. I'm not, I, I'm not, you know, I can't control what he's doing. Uh, so I said, well, uh, you know, may I ask, you know, this is through uh, the, the media. You know, she never calls back, uh, even though she introduced me years ago as a, when she was a consumer advocate in San Francisco. That was another era. But in between a reporter who's going back and forth, I said, well, ask her if she files a joint return. <laughs> well, maybe she doesn't. Uh, so maybe they file separate returns so that the profits of the real estate business don't uh, accrue to her. But the real answer is she votes for appropriations. She votes for oversight. And if she doesn't challenge this contract, if she doesn't go on a floor and challenge this contract or in committee, never mind spouse, no spouse, no spouse, she is not fulfilling her senatorial duties. So you want to make that very, very clear, very, very clear to her. Now you can get this letter, and see, she thinks this letter is now over. You know, it's had its whatever impact over. The thing you want to do with politicians is you got to persuade them that it ain't over until it's over, <laughs> as Yogi Berra used to say. Okay? <laughs> so get this copy. You can get it from going to my uh, nader.org. Okay, it's very simple, nader.org. And search for the fine Senator Feinstein letter. It'll come out, download it, and then send it to her. Okay. Keep sending it to her. And not just Washington. It's much more effective to send it to her offices here. Here, they're very, they're, yeah, they're, they're much more by mail. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, and it's not going to be a, a stamp on Richard Blum after he wrecks all these beautiful post offices. Now, there's a beautiful post office in Greenwich, Connecticut. And all these rich people in Greenwich, they say, oh, me, oh, my. They didn't even lift a finger to, to save it. And it's gone now. 
Same thing down in North Carolina. They seem to be starting with the most historic post offices because they think they can get the best price uh, for it. So how many of you, I have to ask you this, how many of you are going to download the letter and send it to Feinstein? Okay. Some of you said, no, what, what's wrong here? Let me see it again. How many? Okay. You want to win? How many of you want to win? Okay. All right. Now, how many of you are going to extend to your children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, whatever, the, the significance of this and the significance of the post office? How many? Okay. And bring some of them down and show them how to write a thank you letter. They're seven, eight years old. Show them how to write. I suggest to the post office they could probably get a billion dollars in revenue by starting a tradition of parents bringing down their children to 32,000 post offices and teach them how to write thank you letters and thank you notes. See? It's not that hard. It's not that hard. The thing you want to do on all issues for justice is tell people it's easier than we think. Easier than we think. Historically, every major social justice movement started and ended with less than 1% of the people being really active. Less than 1%. And I don't mean, you know, 50 hours a week. Really active means up to 200 to 300 hours a year. That's all. Women's suffrage, abolition of slavery, apart from the Civil War, <laughs> abolition of slavery, the farmer populist revolt out of Texas in 1887, the labor movement, all started and ended with victory, with less than 1% of the people. You know, you heard Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Oakland, you know, talking about 1%, the 1%. They left out the other 1%. The 1% that could bring the other 1% to heal. That's 3 million, that's 3 million people we're talking about in congressional districts all over the country. Piece of cake. How many times do we have to say it? How many times do we have to give you examples? It's a piece of cake. Stop exaggerating the opposition. They're bullies and like any bullies, you know what brings them down. Right? Citizen courage showing up. I have a, a bill that I carry around. Let's see if it's still here. <laughs> well. Come on, we know the problem's profit. Get over it. <laughs> How many times do you have to go derivatively redundant? We've got to take the next step here. Here it is. Here it is. This is my favorite bill. Two dollar bill. Okay? Do you know what's on the back of the two dollar bill? No. You remember the King George III tyranny? These are the people who gathered to sign the Declaration of Independence, Independence 1776, July 4th, and they thought they were signing a death warrant. They're up against the most powerful military force in the world at that time. Yeah, a lot of them were rich and they were all white and they're males. But, you know, even rich white males can demonstrate courage, right? All right. So, so we put this up on windows and everywhere we go because the message is twofold. Aren't you glad these people showed up? And the second one is...